Okay, let's start the class with a little bit of a warm up. First thing we're going to do is learn a new assembly instruction, CPU ID, which stands for CPU Feature Identification. So as Intel continues to change its hardware over time, they need a way for software to find out whether or not particular features are available. So whether or not it supports hardware virtualization, hyperthreading, thermal monitors, or a variety of new security features. CPU ID is a mechanism in order to find out whether or not the CPU, ID, CPU supports these functions. So CPU ID doesn't exactly have operands per se to the instruction, it is just CPU ID instruction, but it takes a sort of input in a value that is placed into EAX. It is EAX even on 64-bit systems, it's not RAX, it's still using the EAX register. And also sometimes some particular things that need to be looked up will also put a value in ECX. So basically software puts values into EAX and ECX, and then after the CPU ID instruction is executed, the outputs are stored in E, A, B, C, D, X. So EAX, BX, ECX, EDX. So the first thing is technically CPU ID didn't exist on the first systems. So you would have to actually look up whether or not the hardware even supports CPU ID. Well, of course, everyone at this point should be running something older than a 486. Otherwise, I don't know exactly how you think you're going to do a 64-bit class. But just to kind of cover how this worked and to hit another one of those bits in the eFlags register, we find out that whether or not the CPU supports the CPU ID instruction is conveyed via the ID flag, which is bit 21 in the eFlags register. And how software figures out whether or not CPU ID is supported is they don't just look, is it one, is it zero? They have to be able to set and clear the flag and that will indicate support for CPU ID. So here is the first of the new flags that I promised to show you, the ID flag, bit 21 in eFlags register. And so how would we change the eFlags register? How would we set and clear the eFlags register? Well, to do that, we need some more instructions, specifically the push F for flag, as in E flags or flags as it originally was, push F Q, quad word size, that's the R flags register, and pop F Q. So basically, remember the Q word form of E flags is R flags. It's really just got a bunch of, it's got 32 extra bits that don't do anything. They're all zero. So all the real bits are in the bottom 32 bits. And so sometimes I mention this just because some things like, you know, Visual Studio, for instance, will actually say uh, E flags instead of R flags. So sometimes I'll say one or the other, but all the relevant bits are in E flags. So push FQ, it's going to push the R flags register onto the stack. And so the idea would be push it onto the stack and then manipulate the value that's on the stack and then pop it back into the register using the pop FQ. And so the thing is, when you're setting flags this way, there are actually going to be some flags in the R flags register, which will not actually be set unless you're running in kernel mode. So just so you know, not everything that you might find in the R flags register can actually be set by everyone in user space. Now let's look at some examples of CPU ID inputs and outputs. So in the Intel manual, this column represents the values that would be put into the EAX value. Uh, EAX register. So if you put zero into EAX and then you executed CPU ID, what you would get is the output EAX would have the maximum input value, basically telling you like what is the maximum value that could exist in this column. And then EBX, EDX, ECX would contain the string genuine, that's a capital I, not a lowercase l, I Intel. So genuine Intel. And you can actually see Wikipedia if you want for CPU ID, if you want to see other vendors, AMD has a different string that would appear. And so that's how you can tell if this was a Intel system versus AMD and a bunch of other different vendors. If they supported x86, will provide some sort of different value here to say, no, we're not an Intel processor. We're something else that's implementing x86. We'll actually see this one a little bit later, input two, when we start covering uh, the cache and TLB information. But here's one that is a little more interesting to us here at Open Security Training, uh, some security bits. So if the input is seven and the ECX is zero, because there's gonna be a seven and something that's non-zero, so seven and zero, uh, bit two would, for instance, tell you whether or not supports Intel Software Guard extensions. 
which is its way, uh, Intel security technology for providing a sort of isolated enclave of execution. Uh, bit 7 here in the EBX register would tell us whether or not it supports supervisory mode execution preventions, MEP. That's a security mechanism that the kernel can use in order to basically say, dear kernel, dear myself, don't let me execute stuff in user space uh, code areas. So that can be used to help uh, mitigate against certain types of exploits where an attacker forces the kernel to jump to code that they control in user space. And there's SMEP and there's SMAP. And if SMEP is execution prevention, SMAP is access prevention. And this basically just says, you know, stop the kernel from, you know, accessing data that is in user space because maybe the attacker is, you know, again, trying to trick the kernel into reading data they control. So we'll cover SMEP and SMAP a little bit later on, but really that's a topic for later exploits classes. All right, so let's go ahead and see a basic lab that uses the CPU ID instruction. And this is basically going to be a uh, template or a framework to let you fiddle around and later on, you know, read and uh, see particular things that are supported on your hardware. So you should have already set up your code in your class, but just to show it in case you didn't. Uh, again, you have to go to the downloads page. That URL is on the set this up before you start the class. You're supposed to download the zip file and open it, expand it, extract it all, extract. And then I requested that you put it onto your desktop just so that you know we all have a common location. And I've got some older version, but this is the version I did right now. And then you open up the solution file, architecture 2001, OS internals. You're gonna get a prompt that says, you know, hey, this is untrustworthy. And you say, like, don't ask me that. I know I just downloaded and hit okay. So UCPID is what we're gonna to wanna to look at. I uh, renamed the various projects to have K if they're gonna execute in kernel space and U if they're meant to execute in user space. So if we look at the source code for UCPU ID, there's a thing called is CPU ID supported, which is found in our assembly code here. And that has to do with the thing about push F and pop FQ to modify the bits to confirm that we can really use the CPU ID instruction. Again, everyone should have CPU ID capable systems at this point, but if you want a single step through that, you can see what's going on with the pushing of the flags under the stack and the modifying the flags. And so basically this code is going to check if CPU ID is supported. We expect everyone to have a CPU ID supported. And then it'll go down to call CPU ID, which is another little assembly function that we have here. And so all this does is it takes a variety of, it takes some input arguments, which are the ECX and the EAX, which are supposed to be set. And then it takes some output arguments, which are the EAX out, EBX out, ECX, EDX out. And it's basically passing by reference uh, pointers to places where to store those. It's going to set your value into the RAX register, really the lower bits being the EAX and ECX. And then it's gonna just call the CPU ID assembly instruction. Afterwards, it's going to store back out those values from EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX and consequently those will be placed into the C variables of EAX out, EBX out, ECX out, EDX out. So we said that if EAX was zero, then the EAX out is going to be the maximum input value for CPU ID information. So that tells you, you know, this is the maximum thing you can actually ask about in CPU ID on this particular processor, because of course that'll keep increasing over time as new features get added. And then we're taking this EBX, EDX, ECX and concatenating them in sort of the right order, sticking a null terminator there. And this should be our genuine Intel string because that's what the manual says will be conveyed out in EBX, EDX, ECX. And then there's some other things we could do. We could do that thing EAX in of seven and the ECX of zero, call CPU ID. And that should then give us, you know, some bits like in EBX that we can check. So bit two, bit seven, bit 20 will tell us about things like is SGX supported, is SMEP supported, is SMAP supported. 
and there'll be some further things that we'll cover later on in the class. And you can, of course, just edit this to your heart's content to check out anything you want to. So what I want you to do is go ahead and set a breakpoint on the last line of this code. Make sure, so this is the reason why I wanted to show you this is because it's a little counterintuitive. First time you open up the solution, you gotta make sure you're in 64-bit compilation, not ARM, which was the default. And then you can go ahead and just run the thing in a debugger. Once you do that, what you will see is the output basically saying the maximum input value for CPU ID is 22 on this particular processor that it's executing on right now. The identity string is genuine Intel. And based on the bits, it does not support SGX inside this processor, inside this virtualization. Now, sometimes uh, your virtualization environment might actually lie about CPU ID information. So that's kind of part of the game with virtualization if you're running something in a VM like I am right now. The hypervisor can, at its will, choose to you know, intercept things like CPU ID and lie about the register values that come back. So you know, we don't really know whether or not this processor supports SGX or not. We don't really know whether it supports SMAP or SMAP. Could be the virtualization lying to us. You'd have to actually run this kind of thing outside of your virtual machine on the raw hardware to find out what's really true. But anyways, for now, it tells us it doesn't support SGX, and I know that's actually true on my processor, and it says it does support SMAP, and it does support SMAP. So that's the basics of CPU ID. Like I said, you can go ahead and you know go look at the Intel manual for CPU ID and fiddle with this to your heart's content. You know, set different values in, get different values out, and see what's supported on your hardware and what isn't.